Hello, hello, hello. Um, first and foremost, I just want to state that I'm very thankful and gracious for the thousand plus people that have subscribed to my channel. Um, I really appreciate uh, the support and the the drive and ambition of other people to learn leak code, right? All across the world. Um, if you're not subscribed, well, there's two reasons you should subscribe primarily before I continue. First reason is it's gonna make me extremely happy and it costs you nothing. You know what I mean? It's like, all you gotta do is go boop and I'm gonna be so grateful for the remainder of the day. Or maybe you hate me, so maybe you should subscribe. You could also do this. You could subscribe to me, give me a little joy, and then wait a couple days and then unsubscribe, right? That would actually make me feel negative, right? So you could do nothing and I'll feel neutral, but no one feels neutral about anybody. So if you just like my channel a little tiny, tiny bit, what I'm doing right now, you could subscribe to me and it'll make me extremely happy. Or you could subscribe to me and then unsubscribe. And if you dislike me, that would be the best uh, route to follow. So that's the first reason. Second reason is, well, this is an opportunity for you to learn, right? So if you subscribe to me, well, then you're taking action to improve your capacity to delete code because that's what we're doing around here, right? So instead of seeing like 40 Mr. Beast videos that you're gonna waste your time with, at least mine will like pop in the middle and you'll be reminded like, oh, I should probably do a leak code right now. So please subscribe, you know? That's the end of my sales pitch. You can find me on uh, LinkedIn. Okay, so today we're doing problem 3097, shortest subarray with or at least K number two. Okay, so there's a lot of information encapsulated in such a short title, right? We're looking for the shortest subarray. So what's a subarray? Subarray is a continuous set of elements within an array. I like to think of as you pick a left point in the array, you pick a right point in the array, and you select everything in between. You can't skip over elements or anything like that. A subarray could be just one element, right, where the left element is one to the left of the element, right is one to the right, pick that element, or it could be the whole array, it could be also be a subarray, with or at least k. So an or can either be a logical operation like this or this or this, or, or, uh, an or could be a bitwise operation, right, which is, you know, just a well-established uh, bitwise operation where you take a bit string, right, with values, and then you or them, and then you get a new bit string. Um, we'll cover that idea very briefly, but of course, right, if you're doing a medium problem, you should probably already have a pretty strong understanding of what a subarray is, uh, and what an OR operation is, right? Those are fundamental concepts that you should uh, understand pretty thoroughly before attempting uh, a medium, right? You gotta walk before you run, you gotta crawl before you walk. So that would be more of a crawling operation, right? Just getting your fundamentals in order, but we'll review it you know, very quickly uh, in this problem because it actually helps us with the intuition to what the solution is, okay? So with that said, let's go ahead and read the description. Very short description, we always love those. So you're given an array nums of non-negative integers and an integer k. Okay, so you're given nums and you're given integer k as arguments. Um, an array is called special if the bitwise or of all of its elements is at least k. Okay, so we're going to bitwise or all the elements in the subarray. So we kind of smush them together and run this bitwise or operation. And I'll t show you what that looks like in a moment. And if you smush them all together and run that operation, the result has to be at least k for it to be special. And we want to return the length of the shortest special non-empty subarray of nums, okay? Or return negative one if no such thing exists. Well, you know, oring something, uh, if you understand the operation, and we'll go into it again, but if you understand the operation of oring something, well, oring always, I mean, it can stay the same size, but a number will either stay the same size or get bigger when you or it. Because when you or it, you're basically only adding additional information. You're not removing anything. So it kind of makes sense that if we want our value to be at least K, we're going to have to grow the subarray, right? We have to make the subarray bigger and bigger and bigger. So when we or it, it could get bigger. But it might be possible that, you know, we could use a subarray this big to get a value at least to K when we or it all together. But there might also be another subarray that's slightly smaller or much smaller, which also gives us a value that's greater than or equal to K. So that idea kind of intuitively makes sense if you understand the OR operation. Um, but uh, let's go ahead and look at this example. And with this example, we'll explain how the uh, OR operation works. Okay, now I'm looking at example one and example two here. It actually kind of seems like example two is better. Okay, so let's go ahead and do example two. And of course, very unprofessionally, my tablet decided that, uh, you know, it doesn't like being connected. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> connected? Why would I be connected, bro? What are you talking about? Like, that's ridiculous. Oh, I just had it connected too and I disconnected it. All right, 
Three, two, one. Look at that, dude. All right, so with that, let's go ahead and look at this uh, example two. And I'm doing example two because that has just a little bit more information. Okay, so we're going to have our example here. So nums equals 218. Can you guys see that? Yes, you can. And we have a K value equaling 10. Okay, so since we're doing bitwise or operations, it probably makes sense to represent the numbers as their bitwise op, uh, representation so that we can do bitwise or operations. Okay, so... I'm not going to go through a whole lesson of how to, you know, represent numbers in bitwise in bits, but uh, basically, I'll just do it like this so you can see kind of what the idea is, right? It's based on bases. I'm not going to go too much into this. You should probably know this if you're doing an OR problem. But um, essentially what you do, right, is 2 is uh, 0, 1s, 1, 2, 0, 4s. 1 is... Um, one one zero two zero fours eight is zero one zero two zero fours and I need to move this over and it's uh one eight so these would be zero so these are the binary representations of all the numbers right so it's saying the answer is three which corresponds to two one eight and it has the or value of eleven hence we return three why does it have the or value of eleven when you or together two or I'm going to use this little bar representation to uh, signify that I'm doing the OR operation, the bitwise OR operation. 1 or 8 equals 11. Oh, why? Right? This is one of those, uh, if you don't know OR operations, you're saying, why is that 2 plus 1? 8 plus 2 plus 1 is 11, right? So is that why? Sort of, but not really. <laughs> sort of, kind of, maybe, but no. Okay, so... How does an OR operation work? Let's just go through that really quickly. So if you have A or B, and you're doing A or B, what does that look like? This is called a truth table, which basically defines the input and output of an operation uh, based on its bitwise representation. So the way you do this is you say, what are all the combinations of A and B? So A could be 0, 0, 1, 1, and somehow I can't count to 4. All right. And B could be 0, 1, 0, 1. So what I'm doing here is basically showing you all possible combinations of 0 and 1, right? And I'm saying A or B is 0. 0 or 1 is 1. 1 or 0 is 1. 1 is 1 is 1. You can memorize this table or you could just say, well, why is it like this? Why is the result of A or B 0, A or B 1, A or B 1, A or B 1 in these cases? Is if at least 1 or 2 or many are true then the answer is one. If none of them are true, the answer is zero. Okay, so since since um, it's zero, zero here, none, neither of them are true, so the answer is false. Since it's zero and one here, one of them is true, so the answer is true. Since one of them are true here, the answer is true. Since one of them are true, it so happens that both of them are true, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't change anything. Is if, if at least one of them are true, the answer be true. The answer be true. The answer ends up being true. So 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1. So that's the truth table here. So if you were to apply that operation to 2, 1, and 8, what would that end up looking like? Well, we got 0, 0, 1. Is one of them true? Yes. One, 0, 0, 0 is one of them true. So I'm basically doing the OR operation down this line. So 0 or 0 or 1. One of them is true, so the answer is one. Zero or zero or zero. Is one of them true? No, so the answer is zero. Zero, one or zero or zero. The answer is one because one of them is true. At least one of them is true. Is at least one of them are true, then the answer is one. So what's the value of this? Well, then you have to go back in the system. So it's one plus two plus, er, this is zero, so you don't add that in, plus one times eight. So that's eight plus two plus one, which equals 11. Okay, so... This is basically the idea of just oring to get answers, but we haven't even got into the algorithm yet, but it's good to have this as just a foundation, okay? So now we got to get into well, how's this actually going to work, right? Because we got this and we, okay, we know what to do. We're basically looking for the subarray. How do we find the subarray? The, the brute force way would be to look at every subarray and then calculate this value 
And once you do that for every subarray, just find the smallest subarray such that that is the case. Right? So you could do a for loop and then another for loop and you look at every single such subarray, right? You look at a subarray, you say, is this is the applying these operations, right? Applying this operation here like we did here. Just take the subarray, take all the elements, apply this operation, say, okay, is this value greater than K? Oh, it's greater than K, so then that's a good one. So do that for every subarray, find the smallest such subarray where it's special, and you're gravy, right? You're good to go, you're happy, you're, 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 you're excited that your solution works, okay? That's one such option, but uh, it's far too slow, right? Because if you have two, two embedded for loops, you're looking at N squared runtime. Um, the time constraints here are 10 to the five, so 10 to the 5 times 10 to the 5, that's 10 to the 10. And, um, well, it's too slow. You're going to get a time limit exceeded error if you do that. So that's not the answer, right? So what can we do to try to make this work more efficiently? And um, when you're dealing with subarrays and you're trying to find the smallest subarray, Sometimes, not always, it can be good to think about sliding windows. And what's difficult about this explanation today is something deep in my mind, right? I've solved so many elite code problems that something deep and intrinsic, like language, right? I'm communicating right now and using several thousand, I don't know how many rules, I'm using hundreds of rules seamlessly without even thinking. Why? Because something very deeply placed intuitively within the neural network of my mind has resulted in my capacity to speak a language. And something very deep in my mind indicated to me that this was a sliding window problem. And I don't really know exactly what that is. So that's what's weird about solving a lot of problems is that you can develop this strange relationship is you don't even know why you know what you know, you just know it, right? Like language. But let me try my best to describe how I knew this was a sliding window problem when I looked at it, okay? Um, I guess the thing is, is since we're looking for the smallest subarray, right? As soon as we find a solution, we might have overcounted, so we want to remove some of the previous solutions, right? And then we have a new set, and then we can increase and then find new solutions. <laughs> Doesn't make any sense at all, does it? When you look at this system, right? Let's look at this example, okay? This might help you understand why it's sliding window, okay? So we're looking for a subarray with three, okay? So when you have a new example here and you have one, two, three, and k equals two, it, it's saying that the answer is just the subarray three by itself. All right, now we could do all the subarrays together, right, and figure that out, but that's going to be too slow. So how can you figure out that it's just three by itself? Well, if you look at one alone, right, you can look at one alone, and you could say, okay, one is definitely not greater than two. If you do one and two, well, again, let's figure out what these values are in their bitwise operation, in their bitwise form, so we can really uh, try to make this make sense. You know what I mean? Um, so we got one, two, and four. We got uh, one is one, zero, zero, two is one, zero, zero, and three is like that, right? So if we do one and two, the value we're going to end up getting is, well, let's just do some quick math. So that'd be, this is one, so zero. So be two and two. So this would be, these together would give you three. Does that have to be greater than K or greater than equal to? At least K. So it could be two alone, right? But when you do one and two together, you can say it's three, right? which is definitely greater than two, okay? But now you get kind of greedy here, right? Because you're saying, okay, one and two together are greater than our K value two, right? But maybe, maybe just maybe we don't need that one. 
right? What if I just say, okay, this works, so this could be a solution. Would it work if I removed the one? Right? What if I just remove the one from the situation? And then I get two. And I say, oh, well, that, that works too. Right, so if this works, then I can empty it out and restart with three. And three is great, and we say, okay, that works too. So I guess the idea behind a sliding window, how do I how do I describe why this is the answer? Is well, you know, you're growing it out until you get a solution. Right? And then you're saying, okay, I, I grew out the subray until I got a solution. But how many of these elements do I actually need in the subarray in order for it to be a solution, right? The one alone isn't a solution. So I had to add elements in until I got it working. But as I added elements in, maybe that one was actually useless. So if you notice here, right, I added in the next set of elements, but then I'm like, well, I actually don't need the elements before. So that's where the sliding window concept comes in, right? I'm, I'm growing out the system until I get something that works. And since it's a subarray, I have to pick a left point and I have to pick a right point. So then I'm shrinking the system from the left to figure out what I actually need to make this work, right? Until I get to a point where it doesn't work and then I have to continue growing it out again, right? So the basic idea here, right, is that I'm I'm just trying to find fits. And since it's a subarray, there can only be left or right points. I can't skip anything. So there's this natural flow state to it, right? I go from left, I go to right, I find a point, I shrink it till I get it to work. And I find the smallest one and I say, okay, that's the best one. And I go the next one to say, okay, this is the next point where it doesn't work. So then I have to grow it again till it works. And then I can shrink it again until it doesn't work, right? So I'm basically growing and shrinking, growing and shrinking, growing and shrinking. And that's where the sliding window approach comes into play. Right, so the sliding window here is we're trying to find the smallest special array. So we try to squeeze until we get it as small as possible where it works, and then it doesn't work, and then we have to grow it again. It works. We squeeze it to get it as small as possible till it works, then it doesn't work, and then we grow it again. Okay? So that's why this problem has a sliding window sense to it, because we're trying to find the smallest such subarray, which is a perfect candidate for a sliding window solution. Okay. And especially here, because like, let's think of an example where we had um, a random example. Let's say that K was two or K was three. Let's say, for example, we had K equals three and we had an array like this. Or let's. Okay, we had an array like this. Well, I'm trying to like find an array that works and grow it out, right? So I start with L here and I'll have a right pointer that I keep increasing because I'll say, okay, what's the or of this? It's still one, it's still one, it's still one, it's still one. Now it's three, right? So the, the or of this whole thing together is now three. But now that I've grown it out, I'm saying, okay, well, I'm trying to find the small subarray. No such subarray before worked. So basically... I know that from that left point all the way through to here, it didn't work. So by moving the left pointer, it's not going to affect any, I'm not going to miss any subarrays, right? That's the kind of idea of a sliding window that's hard to grasp is like, okay, I'm growing out and now I'm moving my left pointer, but am I missing any subarrays that could possibly work? Well, no, because I've already tried ones that are larger with R. I've tried the largest ones with R where L is growing R. Ugh, this is so confusing, right? But basically the idea is, you know, maybe investigate how sliding windows look work a little bit. But the idea is basically, you know, I can start sliding L over because I got a solution. So let's find the point where there is no longer a solution, right? So this is a solution that I could check because it's greater than three. This could be a solution. 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 And until I get to this point, I know, okay, I've gone too far. Now I'm at a point where it doesn't work again. And then we start playing this R game together. I get here, I get three and two, um... Those together give you three. Wait, no, what's uh, two is two and zero. Three is one and two. So oring those together will give you three. So you get just three again. So now I'm playing the same game. I'm saying, okay, now I have a new subarray so I can shrink the one on the left. 
and bring it over. Eesh. So the point here is, you know, you have an idea of like where to start. You grow it until you get a solution. And then you shrink it until you get um, a scenario where it's no longer the solution. Yikes. This video is so terrible. I really apologize, guys. It's very depressing. But um, let's go ahead and um, think about how sliding windows are built. We'll, I'm going to give you just a very default set of code, and then we're going to have to tweak it to deal with the conditions of this problem. Okay, so sliding windows come up all the time. So you should probably have a mechanism of, you know, like just a default code block that you always use to deal with sliding windows, and then you just have to tweak it for your particular problem. Okay. So in a sliding window, you have a L value that starts at the beginning. And then you're going to have these right values that grow, right? So you have the LF point and your right point of your subarray. And then you're always trying to keep track of what your sliding window value is, right? So at each point, you say, my new sliding window value is some function where you add to the sliding window with the current number at R. Right, so what I'm basically saying here is, you know, at each point I move R, I start R here, I keep adding that to my running, my sliding window value to figure out what the value of the subarray is, right? And then at some point when you keep doing that, right, you reach a point where, right, you reach a point where your value exceeds whatever it is you're looking for, right? So here we're trying to find that special value greater than K, right? So as soon as we get here and we add this in, we find, oh, wait, we just hit a point where this works. So now we need to shrink the array until it doesn't work so we can find all the arrays in between that still meet this condition. So we say, while this value is greater than or equal to our whatever we're looking for, which is K in this case, we're going to say, okay, since it's greater than K, that means that this array is a special array. Right, so we'll have res equals float infinity. That'll be our solution that we return in the end. If res not equal float infinity, because if it still equals float infinity, it means that nothing was true. So we'll return negative one. So we say, okay, this subarray still works. So what we can end up doing here is we can consider this a solution where R and L are right now. So the min of whatever we thought it was before, because maybe some previous subarray was the actual right answer. It was smaller. So we do R minus L plus one. And now I have to make SW smaller. So we have a subtract function. Nums of L. And then we increase L. So we don't want to go overboard, so we say and L is greater than or equal to R. All right, because you don't want... You can't have L exceed R, right? That doesn't make sense, So because it always has to be the left... You have a left point and a right point with left greater than the right point. All right. So this is a basic, you know, screenshotable, memorizable approach to doing sliding windows, and it's one of my favorites, okay? Because it's got a very clear, smooth approach and then you have to define what your add functions are and what your subtract functions are all right and then your subtract function okay so when it goes through this right that's basically what's going on Oh, guys, I really apologize about this one. I just don't, it's so funny because I don't know why I know that it's sliding window. Someone in the comment, give me the intuition, right? Because I've done so many problems that I saw this and knew it was sliding window and I can't really describe why that is, right? But that's just a testament to the importance of doing a lot of leak code problems. You train your brain to, to, to recognize patterns that it itself can't even articulate to you, right? There's some subconscious like low level part of my brain that's capable of understanding this without being able to describe what it is that it's exactly understanding, much like language, right? I don't know the rules of English, I just speak it fluently, right? And I speak English f more fluently, <laughs> apparently I don't. I speak English 
with a higher level than most non-native learners can achieve with years of study without even thinking about it, right? So there's a lot of functionality of our brain that's quite obscure and unintuitive, which is the more I do problems, the better I get at it, but it also becomes more difficult to understand what it is exactly that I understand and why I understand it. But that's just food for thought, okay? So what do we do here now that we got to this point? How can we efficiently find what our sliding window size is like this L and R idea? Okay. Well, let's walk through this example and find out what our sliding window value would be at each step. So here our sliding window value is one. When you move it over, you get one or one, which equals one. When you move it over, you get one or one or one, which equals one. When you move it over, you get one or one or one, which still equals one. When you move it over, you get one or one or one, which still equals one. And then when you move it over, you get one or one zero, which is the two representation. Let's make sure I'm still on screen here. All right, this is the two representation in bits, right? Which gives you the value three. Does that make sense what I'm doing here, right? So basically, as I go through, I know at this point, right, walking through, the value is three and it's the result of this sum, right? Because I took this one from here, 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 and this two, wait, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, and this two from here, I ordered them all together and got three. And you notice that I didn't have to order them all together again. I just did it one at a time, right? And I got three. But now it becomes a factor is how do I unor it, right? Because you have that add function, which is putting them together. And now I need an unor function to take them apart, All right? So I can put this L here and I, I have to delete this somehow, but I don't want to like turn the bit off because it's still three here, right? It's still three. It's still three. It's still three. It's unchanging. So it's weird because it's like, how do I remove these and undo what I just added in? All right, that's where it becomes kind of strange. It becomes strange, right? Because only at this point do we actually change it to just two, right? Only after we delete all of these does it become two again, right? Until it becomes two again. So... How do we, you know, it's like, how do I remove these things? Well, how about instead of like oring it together, we will or together, but we'll keep track of what we've ordered together and how that affects the bits. Okay, so we're going to restart this and I'm going to do something a little bit different. All right, instead I'm going to keep an array, which is a representation of the bits that I have. And when I add in this first one, I say, okay, I'm adding in one zero 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 to my system. When I add this one in, I'm adding in another one. So it becomes two zero zero zero. So I'm basically counting the number of R's of the, of each bit I'm seeing. When I add this in, I have three zero 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 zero. When I add this in, I have four zero 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 zero. When I add this in, I get five zero 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 zero. And then when I, ugh. And then when I add this in finally, To zoom out a little bit here, guys. I get five one zero zero zero. So I'm saying is, 
when I or these together in this table, I'm giving track of the fact that, okay, now I have one of those, two of those, three of those, four of those, five of those, five of those, and one of those. The actual value corresponding here would be just one, 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 and three. Why is that the case? Well, this is just keeping track of the number of these that I have, right? This is the number of ones that I have, but not like the sum of them or something, right? It's just the number that I have. So my equation is still the same, right? If this is greater than zero, then I know there's at least one of them. Because when you or them all together, you get the same thing, right? So if I or five ones together and a two together, it's the same thing as oring just one, two together and one, one, right? That's the thing about ors, right? If you do or one or one, you get one. If you do or one 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 forever, you still get one, right? So we're doing this to keep track of the number of ones that we see, right? But it doesn't actually affect the output score, right? Because that's still just an operation of an or. So we're oring a one, we're oring a two, we're not oring a four because there's no four, we're not oring an eight because there's no eight, we're not oring a 16 because there's no 16, okay? So the answer becomes three here. And then how can we reduce this three value? Watch this. So if we remove this L, we're basically removing a one. And the answer is still three. We move this L again and again and again. We'll go all the way to here. So at this point, there would be three, one, zero, zero. It'd still be three, two, one, zero, zero, zero. It'd still be three. And then when we get to this point, it'd be one, one, zero, zero, zero. All of these would still be three. And now you can capture the fact is when you remove this over, now this becomes zero, one, zero, zero, zero. And now the answer is two. Okay, so basically what I'm doing here is the way we can have an add and subtract function is by keeping track of the number of times we've seen each bit. And once the bit becomes zero, we know that then now when we apply our operation, the answer will be smaller. Does that make sense? So our add function is simple, right? Our add function is we just keep oring things together and we adding it to our index to note all the bits that we've seen. And our undo function is just taking it and saying, okay, I just removed a one, a, I removed an image with a bit one set, so now remove that. I just removed a one bit set, removed a one bit set. Now that it's, when it becomes zero, we've removed all the sets of those. So now we actually make the value smaller. So if that doesn't make sense, let's go ahead and uh, actually do the code. And hopefully that'll help you a little bit. This is definitely a difficult problem to describe and I'm not doing a very good job today. I'm almost considering just redoing this. So if you don't see this, well, if you see this, that means that I didn't end up redoing it. But um, yeah, not my best explanation, not by far. So the way that we'll do this is we'll keep track of all the bits that we've seen. So that little table thing, we'll just call that T. And it'll be initially set to zero. And now we'll do 32 because the largest integer in the system could be 32 bits. So we're going to keep track of the number that we see each bit. Okay, and that's the reason why we can do this, by the way, I should have mentioned that, right? Is that it's easy to do it with this table approach with the bits that are set because the integer that we have can only be 32 bits and it's positive, right? So the add function is where we would look at the num. And we say, okay, well, a new num is just num and we or it with s of w, right? And then we return s of w. But first we want to keep track, right? We want to do this process. Ugh. We want to do this process and keep track of all the times that we've seen uh, each bit set. So we'll say while num and we'll set all the bits. We'll say t of we'll have an i variable so we can look at each ith bit. We'll say t of i plus equal num mod two, i plus equal one, num divided by equals num divided by two. So basically what we're doing is each time we add a number in, right? So let's say, let's 
Let's have a new example here. Oh, man, Ben. Such bad explanation today. Ooh! All right, so let's say we had five, right? Five in bitwise representation is four zero twos and one. So that would mean in our array of one, two, four, eight, sixteen, whatever, right? We'd add in what well, we see one, one here, zero fours and one, one. All right, so if we had five and then seven, okay, seven is um, one, four, one, two, one, one. Right, uh, so seven equals one, one, one. So then if we add that into our system. Well, now we have two ones, one, two, and two fours. All right, so if you or these together, regardless of the number that they are, where there's four plus two plus one is seven. So the oring of all this will give you seven. All right, that would the oring of all this would give you seven. All right, and then if you wanted to start removing things, well, if you want to remove this five, right? You would have to set this to one, this would stay at one, and this two would become one. So you kind of just walk through the thing and find out what bits are set, because the set bits are going to affect the or, right? That's the general idea. If anything, if you hate this solution, the way that I've explained it, at least I've given you, I would like to say good code, okay? Now to make it smaller, we can't just unor it, right? We have to subtract in num mod two, and then we ask the question, well, if we remove something, when do we actually remove that from the bit string? Well, we don't even have to do it like that. We don't even, we could just, um, yeah, I don't want to go through this whole thing. Ooh. We do it like that. Sorry, there's a couple ways you could do this. Basically, if it equals zero and num mod two equals one and num mod two, it just does, it's weird doing it like this too. It's always weird no matter how you do it. What if we just build it out? So I'm gonna build this out instead. So we're gonna rebuild SW based on TI, right? So this will say if ti, so if ti is greater than two, then we do sub w equals two. I, I just don't want to do this. We, I don't want to, there's a lot of ways to do this and I'm trying to figure out the simplest way to do it to explain, okay? But I'm going to do it this way. So I'm going to say c of w equals c of w. And then we're gonna flip off the one bit. So we're gonna flip off the bit corresponding to I. So we're gonna take this one bit and we're gonna move it over I places. So let's make sure that works first. Not only does it doesn't work, it's very weird looking. Oh man, guys, been quiet now. Ugh. Why does it have to be this way? Well, it ha yeah, it would be left to you know, you don't want to exclude the ones. Oof. Eesh. Okay, so why does this work here? Well, the general idea here is well, if you had, um, 
Right, if you thought your, let's say three, let's see, one and two, okay. Say this was your array. Wheels are kind of falling off this one, huh? Say this was your array, one, one, two. Okay, well, your array thing would be one, zero, zero, and then when you add another one, one, zero, zero, and then when you add in the two, it would become two, one, zero, right? Because this would be one, two, four. Does that make sense? So I added in this one, add in another one, then I added in a two. So you would think that your sliding window was one, one, and three. Okay? Which in bitwise representation are zero, one, zero, one, and one, one. Now, once you start removing this, it would still stay one. But then once you remove this one, it would become zero, one, zero. So what bit do you need to unset? You need to unset this first bit. So to do that, you're just going to flip the bit. So an XOR operation will let you flip the bit. Okay. And which bit are you going to flip? You're going to flip the one that just became a zero. So when you slide through and you say, okay, this becomes a zero, you're going to flip that bit off. Hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. If it doesn't, please leave me a comment below. Terrible, terrible, terrible job today explaining this. So for time and for space. All right, so this uh, sliding window approach, even though it has a while loop within a for loop, it's only O of N because, you know, R, L will never pass N. So as R grows, L will only grow behind it, so it'll only touch it. But there's no way to you have N squared in that situation, right? You grow R, you grow L, you grow R, you grow L. So R only goes across the whole array once, and L only goes across the array at most once. Okay, so that's O of N. These operations, how long do they take? Well, you'll notice that there's while loops in there too. So the code analysis of this is kind of complex, right? Because, okay, this add function has a while loop and so does this sub function. So does that mean that it's another N? Well, this thing, right? Notice how it's 32. The bits can only be 32. So this means that there's only 32 bits in each integer. So we're looking at each bit here. So we can only look at most 32 bits. So this takes 32 operations and this takes 32 operations. So we do N operations. We do 32 operations here, 32 operations here, 32 operations are constant, right? So we do constant operations because it doesn't really matter. Right? It's really like O of 32 times N, but that's really just O of N. Okay, and then we just do a quick comparison. So that's O of N time for space. Well, all we do is we create a few variables here, right? And we create this T thing, which is 32, no matter what, no matter how many nums we have, we only create this thing of size 32. So that's O32, which is O1. Okay, guys, that's the end of this solution. I apologize for the quality of this uh, uh, recording.